It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 297 of Science on Top. Today's Sunday, the 20th of May, 2018. I'm Ed Brown and joining me today is Penny Dumsday. Hello. Lucas Randall. Hello. A composer and sound designer, Peter Miller. Hey there. And a final year journalism student at RMIT, Elena Hansen. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we were talking a bit before the show. You're doing journalism, but uh, science journalism is where you really want to go. Is that right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so my official degree is just straight journalism, but I've done a lot of my volunteer stuff in science journalism. And one day I want to write for the BBC in BBC Earth. So that'll be pretty awesome. cool. <laughs> that would. And can I say thank you for having that goal and good luck because we need science journalists. It's a, a dying area, I think. And we appreciate the new blood. It's good. Absolutely. You know, finding my feet, but hopefully one day it'll be quite steady and just, you know, going up like a roller coaster. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I look forward to be able to say uh, we knew you before you hit the big time. Absolutely. <laughs> I love that. All right. Well, before we get started, I just want to remind everyone you can help us make the show by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. Different levels of support will get you different rewards. And of course, we greatly appreciate all the help we get. And on the show today, we'll be talking about the chances of life on Jupiter's moon Europa, the ice core that tells of the economic health of the Roman Empire, some clever magpies, and the origins of the frog-killing fungus. But before that, we really should begin with the big news of the week, the important story. Peter, what am I hearing here? Laurel. Laurel. Am I hearing Laurel or is it Yanni or is it Nyari or some other bizarre interpretation? I've heard a lot of different things. Yes, well, of course, that's the that seems to be the talk of the internet at the moment is the uh, the the Yanni uh, Laurel thing, uh, and it's, it's the uh, the dress that we had a few years ago, yeah, the that's blue right, and yeah, white, gold and black, whatever. The dress. Well, that, although I, I I think that for me it's more like that optical illusion you might have seen the visual illusion where you can't tell whether this thing is a duck or a rabbit it kind of yes yeah. back and forth between a duck and a rabbit and it kind of has that sort of effect to me where you where you can't really make that decision um but yeah so this is an interesting phenomenon i mean i i kind of glommed onto it really quickly because these kinds of oral illusions are something that i find uh, incredibly interesting and uh, it's it started out apparently uh, at the beginning of May, so it's 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 all hit our our feeds this week. Um, but it's been happening for you know a little a few days before that. It's been sort of pottering around the Twitterverse, uh, and then sort of blew up uh, at the beginning of this week. And uh, yes, it's a piece of uh, it's a one little word. Uh, which uh, is in fact laurel. It is somebody saying the word laurel, um, but it sounds to many people like they're saying yanny, uh, or in, in the case of me, I hear it as yearly, which is, is not quite the same, um, but certainly not not laurel. Uh, and it appears that what's going on here is that uh, we, we've got a word um, that has various kinds of overtones to it and depending on what kind of device you hear it on you're going to hear more or less of the of the overtones you need to hear the word in one way or in another way um, so uh, <clears throat> if you hear it uh, there's been a, a I've noticed a couple of um, websites have had things like uh, you know that this is an indicator of hearing problems well don't rest assured it isn't that um, you're not having hearing problems if you hear it one way or the other. Uh, it's, Good, because I've heard both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, it's most likely to do with the kind of device that you've actually heard this, this piece of uh, audio on. Um, and it's quite clear that if you take away most of the high frequencies of the Laurel Yanni word, uh, that most people hear the word Laurel. So there's something to do with the fact that the high frequencies have got some component that allows you to hear um, the, the Yanni part of it. 
So it's quite fascinating, I think. And of course, many people will have heard this on their laptop or on their tablets, and the speakers on those devices don't have a lot of low frequencies in them. So if you've, if you've heard it on your laptop, you're very highly likely to have heard it, as, as saying Yanni. Uh, if you've heard it on, uh, on your really nice speakers, you might have, have heard it as Laurel. But also, I think um, the original uh, clip, if you look, I think it was from vocabulary.com. Yeah, like that's that. right. Mm. And the interesting story behind that is they actually got opera singers to read a lot of the words for the pronunciation because they're very good at reading the IPA, sort of phonetic alphabet. Of course. And they have a lot of range of um, voice and uh, technique anyway. Um, but the original, pretty much no matter what device you hear it on, it is Laurel. Yes. But it's... The, the clip that everyone's listening to has been degraded an awful lot uh, because it's been recorded from speakers and then played back and then recorded from that. Um, Correct. So I think that must have part of it to do as well. Yeah, yes. I mean, you know, the first thing that happens with most uh, audio when it goes onto the, onto the internet is that it gets turned into an MP3 or, or some form of compressed file. And, and this is almost certainly a compressed file. You can hear uh, that, that, that not all the audio frequency is there and, and so forth. So that's going to contribute to it as well. There's no question about that. Um, but even, even if you hear it, uh, some people can hear it quite clearly as Laurel. The first time I heard it, I heard it as Laurel and I was listening on my laptop. So um, I was quite confused that people could hear it as Yanni. Uh, but now I can hear it quite clearly as, as either. I can, I've trained my ear to flip it back and forward so I can actually hear it as, as either. And some, and some investigators have actually taken spectrograms of the word and shown you that the, the harmonics in the word have some of the basis of each of those those particular words in it so it just depends on many contexts as to as to what you hear also um a predisposition if somebody tells you that you're going to be listening to yanni there is a high likelihood that you will you will hear that uh, and if you're told that it'll be laurel it's a high likelihood and there's even now I, i'm sure you've heard there's a, an, a further illusion that people have posted which is called brainstorm green needle and uh, it, depending uh, on, on what you're told, you hear it either as, of one of those phrases, either brainstorm or green needle. And I think it's an even more profound uh, version of the illusion because uh, it does seem to be that you can't hear it as one if you're looking at the word for the other. Yeah, that, that's priming. That's been around for a while. Sure. We've often seen, you know, when you read someone else's interpretations of lyrics, yeah. then suddenly you start yeah, yes. hearing that and you can't hear the original absolutely and, and i'm sure you've you, you're familiar with that that uh technique of back masking where people play things backwards and then they say you you know you hear these words and you first of all you don't hear anything at all but when someone says to you this is the word you're hearing you go oh yes i can hear that quite clearly now and then you can't unhear it of course <laughs> once that's happened or, or me i hear worship satan all the time. forwards yeah. or backwards so you know <laughs> that's just the voices <laughs> that's playing things forward too <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's even in the silence. <laughs> <laughs> Especially then. Uh, but I think it's it's just a, a further example of how easily fooled our brains can be, whether it's a visual illusion, an auditory illusion, or even a sensory illusion sometimes as well. Yes. Our, our brains are pattern-seeking things, and they're, they're just easily fooled. Yes, it's how we see the reality. That is right. It's a good thing to keep in mind when, you, when you're actually on the internet that what you're seeing or hearing may not be actually what you're seeing or hearing. But if it's on the internet, it's probably true. <laughs> Lucas, let's talk about Europa then, the fourth largest of the moons of Jupiter. And we've long had reason to believe there's an ocean below its surface. But now a new study revisiting, I think, some old data from the Galileo probe suggests there may also be plumes of water erupting from the moon as well. And this has some pretty big implications for some upcoming missions, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we did a story, uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, uh, where some old... Uh, do you remember some old imaging was used? Yeah, uh, to Voyager. Look at the plumes from, yeah, right. some, uh, for, in that case, they were looking at the plumes coming from Enceladus. 
Um, and I thought that was really, really cool to go back and use, you know, old old data in this case, old images from uh, from previous missions to uh, to see if we, you know, in retrospect, you know, the benefit of hindsight, we can we can have a look around and see is there actually evidence of these plumes previously? And and of course there was, and it turned out that, you know, uh, there was a project that a particular individual had been running for quite some time trying to find these uh, evidence of plumes from Enceladus, um, and and. Unfortunately, none of the imaging from Voyager of Enceladus was of the right angle with the sun behind it to actually show it up. But then he had this this you know mind uh, you know bubble uh, that sort of said, "Hey, what if uh, what if Enceladus was actually caught in one of the other images of Saturn itself and and hadn't been notarized?" It's like you know unless someone had actually made a note, sort of in the metadata, if you like, of those images, uh, you know, in the text uh, recording of those images that uh, this this image contains Saturn and and you know this moon and that moon. Um, it might have been missed, and and of course he he went back and, and found exactly that. So again, Enceladus has a relationship to this story as well, because Enceladus has now given us a, a model of what to look for. We 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 learned quite a lot with the Cassini mission, uh, with its its uh, initial discoveries of the the ice plumes from um, from Enceladus, and then its its many many orbits. Uh, that, that that allowed it to to uh, have a look at those um, those ice plumes, and over time we build up more of a picture of of what they what they look like. So Cassini basically th- flew past Enceladus about twenty something times, twenty two times I think it was, which which enabled us to actually do some some um, some sampling of of the water plumes themselves, and and what Enceladus found was that as well as water. Um, and ions and charged grains of plumes and Celtus found sodium and that gave us the first indications that the water um, you know the subsurface ocean on Enceladus was was potentially a salty a salty ocean it also found silicates and that you know, silicates if you think of silicon silicates from sand that basically indicates a sandy ocean floor so it's the first indication of, of okay maybe Enceladus isn't just a big chunk of ice, uh, which for all intents and purposes it looked like. And having an ocean floor also potentially uh, indicates the existence of hydrothermal vents because we see those on Earth. Um, and if there's sand and hydrothermal vents and water, we tend to see there's also a relationship with that particular mix of things with life on Earth. So that's why Enceladus is quite a, an interesting sort of uh, uh, place to explore further. Now, Further uh, observations from Cassini also discovered back in, in um, uh, the story says 2107, I think it's 2017, because <laughs> I, I don't recall, I'm pretty sure in Cell- I'm pretty sure uh, Cassini's gone now, it, it got mm, it had yes. its death plunge. So, uh, so in, in 2017 it discovered um, uh, hydrogen in these plumes and that was also an indication of the potential um, water sand reactions it's basically a byproduct so pretty much I mean all of the pieces are there what we would expect to see if there were the conditions that were right for life were pretty much what we found using the extent of the instrumentation that was on the Cassini probe unfortunately Cassini probe didn't have um, the, the the final bit of instrumentation that would have given us uh, a little bit more proof, but hey, that's uh, that's where these other studies are going to come in. So based on these discoveries, the the um, I guess the the attention was turned to Europa because Europa has long been one of the greatest candidates for um, you know for for extraterrestrial life, and and uh, in fact, uh, someone on the show right now produced a really cool um, <laughs> <laughs> a piece of work. Uh, how would you best describe your your Europa, um, what is it exactly? It's, it's it was a visual, but also an audio. It was, it was vi- like it. Yeah, what? How would you describe it, Pete? Um, well, it's very generous of you to throw to my artwork, um, <laughs> Lucas. But uh, look, you know, I I, I I got the idea for doing it um, once when I was uh, I was actually in the it was in the early stages of um, I think it was one of the voyages, and it was going out past. Um, Jupiter, and I, I at that time I was living in Sydney, and I was walking past uh, Martin Square, Martin Place, where they had a huge uh, video screen, and they were showing all these incredible pictures of 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 Jupiter, 
and uh, and everyone was just sitting there eating their lunches and I was just thinking wow this that's just so weird that you know this is happening and I got to thinking about that idea of um uh, what would happen if we if we found uh, some kind of intelligent not intelligent life but any kind of life on another planet and my imagination had this thing of of an automated probe that gets sent to Europa and it finds something and it's in the middle of the night and there's a cleaner just cleaning up and these images are going across the screens and no one notices until obviously the next day or something. And that was why I came up with the idea, but it's just a speculative work. It's about, um, it's just assuming that we, these days, anything we know about the rest of the universe, anything that's not on our planet is done through augmentation. It's, it's, it's done by these devices that we send to other places and we can only tell what we are actually experiencing from that other place through the instrumentation of those devices. And I, I got to thinking about what it, what it must be like if you saw something, these images coming back and you just did not know what they were. You had no way of knowing. You just have to watch them and how amazing that would be. So that's what it was. And it's basically, a, it's, a, it's an hour long piece, which is designed, it's made up of several different screens and they just show images just interesting images i think i i loved it i, I thoroughly enjoyed it and for me it was it was a very um it was almost like laying back in the dark listening to pink floyd for me it's kind of like one of those things that just you know creates a whole lot of uh um you know mental well, not just mental imagery because obviously you've got imagery along with this one but it, it really inspires the imagination and and i think for me that's exactly why i thought of it when i was reading this because you know europa has has long been this this uh this very enticing target yeah. and there's been some some missions that have been proposed that haven't really got off the ground in terms of funding and so forth um to go and, and have a look at Europa, and of course, the the whole um, the whole science community is trying to come to terms with exactly what are what are our our guiding principles when it comes to exploring bodies that may in fact have right. have life on them. And this this came up, you know, when when uh, the, the the Cassini team were deciding what to do with the probe because they hadn't really thought that they would they would potentially finds you know life harboring um worlds out there in in terms of uh saturn and its moons i mean if we obviously over the over the years we've we've, we've discussed various um hypotheses around what sort of life might exist on titan but titan is an incredibly different mm. you know um uh environments and, and it wouldn't be life as we know it but that doesn't mean it's not there and then, of course, discovering these ice flumes from from Enceladus really changed the game, and it and it and it threw a spanner in the works for the Cassini team because they suddenly had to actually go. Well, what if bits of Cassini ended up on Enceladus, and then we might end up either a, you know, basically seeding life on Enceladus because of some, you know, crazy, you know, hardy molecules of, of or bacteria or something that's hitched a ride on on uh, Cassini all of these years or we might if we might do that and also if you know if impact life that's already there um, you know we might introduce a virus or something like that there so so quite some time ago there was um, some tantalizing evidence of some plumes on um, on Europa which came courtesy of the Hubble Space Telescope because the Hubble's uh, telescope had basically seen visually had 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 recorded some uh, indications of plumes um, on Europa's surface ocean between uh, subsurface ocean between 2012 and 2016 but the problem with that was they're just visual observations and of course they're from a long way away because Hubble orbits Earth um, so there weren't really enough um, but this this uh, new evidence that's been published uh, in the what was it the Nature Nature Astronomy published in Nature Astronomy yeah so this new evidence is, or this new um, uh, paper that's published in in uh, uh, Nature Astronomy is coming from some some returns to old data from the Galileo mission back in 1997 wow which which was based on its magnometer uh, readings um, so basically. The magnometer uh, it, it has it, it appears to have been impacted by the ionized particles in the plumes, because 
being ionized, they're they're obviously they they've got a charge. They carry a negative charge. So once they're charged, they actually affect um, a magnometer, which is if you think of something really simple on Earth, it'll be a compass, right? So um, these these particles that can actually affect it because they have a, a charge. So um, and that that. Charge, those charged particles are one of the things that we would expect to see um, if they were coming from a subsurface ocean. So this is why we're thinking that this, this area of di disruption that, um, uh, that Galileo flew through uh, back in 97 was actually probably a plume. So again, really, really cool. So where does it lead next? Well, obviously, there's a few there's a few uh, missions that are, are proposed to to head off to uh, to Europa, and and we're really going to have to wait until we see. There's two, you know, particularly important ones: the the Juice uh, mission, which is a, a, a European Space Agency mission. I What's love wrong? the name Juice mission. It's like yeah, we always yeah. talk about the names they come up with. Sometimes they're really boring, like the Extra Large Telescope. Other times it's juice yeah. <laughs> or something bizarre. <laughs> and yeah. Jupiter, the juice is because yeah, they always like to just take the letters of the words that that they can use in their acronym. You know, they don't want to. They don't want to take like ju it's actually Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, right? That, that, <laughs> yep. How did uh, you know? You look at the juice. Wh where's the? Moon? That's no. There's no moon in there. You can't see any. There's no M. <laughs> no, they take the J and the U from Jupiter and the I and the C from Icy. They just skip moons and add Explorer. So I mean, that's yeah. fine. Um, uh, I love it. That's great. It's memorable. So it is. <laughs> it is. So juice. Um, uh, Juice is launching around 2022, um, arriving in, in in the Jupiter system in 2030 or so, uh, and that that includes a couple of close flybys of Europa um, in in its mission, and then it will settle down into an orbit around Ganymede, uh, which is really really cool. And now I've I've been exposed to some of the information about that mission, and I want to know a lot more about <laughs> it um, because once upon a time 2030 sounded a really long way away. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. And I've, I've, I've recently, you know, over the last decade or so, become privy to one of those things that affect adults. That time moves much faster as you get older. Um, and the, the other one I'm is I'm putting the, things uh, in my calendar for 2020, and I'm like, that's always <laughs> been decades away. <laughs> I remember looking at, at the year 2000 with just such amazement of, like, one day yep. we'll be there. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, sorry, Pete. We're going into uh, when I was a boy. Uh, today. Yeah, <laughs> I won't even start on that. <laughs> and the other one is the uh, Europa Clipper, uh, which is which is um, a NASA mission, um, and that that includes apparently about forty five flybys of Europa. So they'll have more instrumentation on them, and they'll be able to uh, find some uh, very important things because they will be basically able to uh uh to look for some of the signatures of of, of life so so that's uh that's exciting but uh, obviously we won't be covering that in an upcoming show very soon because it is uh it is a few years a few out. episodes away a few episodes away yeah. yeah something to keep an eye on and follow up on but um i love that going back to old data and finding something that we overlooked yeah. 10 years ago whatever yeah right? That is so cool, I, I, and and again, I mean, this one wasn't uh, wasn't a citizen science project like the the last one was that I mentioned before, but still uh, still really cool that uh, they can go. Mm, ah, in this context, we can now reconsider these readings that we we saw back then. So yeah, very cool. Awesome. Okay, Elena, let's talk about some new study and some new data now, shall we? Uh, we've talked a fair bit on the show already about the fungus that's devastating amphibian populations around the world. And now a study has traced the genetic origins of the fungus back to the global pet trade and in particular East Asia, is that right? That's right, absolutely. So there was a study uh, recently published in Science Journal which supports the idea that the chytrid fungal disease or chytridiomycosis, which is <laughs> quite a nice. tongue twister there, um, it's a disease that affects many wild amphibians such as frogs, newts um, and salamanders and toads. And what they think is that it could have originated in East Asia. So what they did, they um, looked at a lot of global samples and they sequenced those genomes. And then they decided that there were four main lineages. And while three of those lineages were globally distributed, um, one type of the disease, or at least um, had a wide um, 
diversity or, or widespread of disease was actually restricted to the Korean Peninsula. So this is more so like a hotspot of where um, chytridiomycosis was actually spreading very quickly and killing off a lot of their native frog populations. Um, so for people who have yeah, just tuned into this episode and don't actually know what it is, um, it's a disease um, which attacks the animal's skin and it interferes with their ability to regulate their levels of water and electrolytes, which you know are quite essential for their biological functions. Um, so apart from their skin actually kind of shedding off and it becomes dry and, and flaky and, um, yeah, terrible, it can also lead to heart failure. Um, so frogs are very small and their hearts are also like make up quite um, are a big important organ for them as they are for us. And, yeah, it just wipes them out, which is so sad to see because we've actually had um, our corroboree frogs in the southern tablelands in Queensland, there was a massive um, disease impact there. They've had some in Europe um, and America, which the I think is the American bullfrog is actually immune to it. So what's interesting is that it, it um, affects some frogs or some um, amphibious animals and not others, and they don't really know why yet. Um, but what they're thinking is um, this... Um, Korean form in particular um, is native to the region and it shows a lot of genetic overlap. So it's quite like a really um, intense form of the disease. And even though it originates in East Asia, it's gone to all these hotspots around the world, as I said, in America and Europe, um, through the illegal pet trade or exotic pet trade, really, because they can be stowaways in um, boxes of bananas and fruits and everything. And we're shipping them overseas and a lot of people are actually having them as pets and keeping them and that's not right we shouldn't be doing that um to wild animals taking them out of their habitats and into this foreign like tank where they're probably not going to survive long anyway um yes yeah, so it was quite interesting that they figured this out in their 10 year long study and what they're highlighting is that we really need to tighten um, biosecurity along country borders, making sure that they're going through the boxes and, make, yeah, not finding any frogs in them um, and potentially putting a ban on the trade of amphibians as pets, which is probably a good idea because we should localise our animal species and ideally keep them in their wild habitats or have them for conservation purposes and, and breeding and such and not really have them as, you know, something nice to keep and look at and then... Certainly, yeah, you want to limit how much they can spread, especially yeah. can, considering they can be carrying diseases, viruses or uh, fungus yeah. into the wild populations of other countries and other areas, yeah. yeah. Which isn't good because we need to keep our wildlife diversity as much as possible and it's just these little things that I mean to us it's going to cause nothing but you'll see like even if you watch David Attenborough documentaries on amphibians which <laughs> I tend to do that a lot um <laughs> but yeah you see the, the spread of disease and how it affects them and it's just like this shouldn't be happening but actually there are no known measures of control yet or any effective measures so once it starts pre spreading in an area it's very hard to um quarantine it and especially if those animals are going overseas and they're not being tracked well that's just you know going everywhere and not mm. ca causing a lot of damage it's interesting did you say it was a 10-year study yeah i believe it was a very long study that, that surprised they... me because I, I would have thought i mean when you look at genetic uh, testing now we can do it so quickly i would have thought it would be something that we could very quickly track but i guess they probably had a lot of genomes to sequence and obviously 10 years ago, the technology wasn't there. But What they're saying is that they haven't actually done a lot of specific studies to East Asia. So right, that okay. might be one of them. Um, I, mean, I suppose like they're trying to um, look at different ways that they could figure this out. They had two th no, hang on, 234 samples. Well, this page says it's 234. I was very, yeah, for the past 10 years, um, they've been hunting for the origins of... Uh, yeah, the, the DNA of the um, fungus. Right. Yeah. yeah. Pretty cool. cool. But, uh, of course, once you actually get the genome, you can start looking for ways to target any weaknesses in it, of course. So. Yeah, 
yeah, absolutely. That's at least a, a start. Good news. It is a start, and they can keep going on. Um, yeah, it did take them a while to actually find an origin for it, but I feel like once they've found this out, then they can realise what their methods were and try them um, in another area just to really combat the disease because it has such a really um, devastating impact. Yeah, it's huge. And maybe we can adapt the fungus to only target cane toads. <laughs> yeah, that would be good for Australia. <laughs> That could work. Yeah, they, they um, tried obviously. that kind of thing before, Ed. It didn't work out so well. I mean, that was one, <laughs> that's, that's how we right. control that's, populations. We introduce yeah, other animals to get what, them. That's, that's what, what we always got, works. That's why we got the cane toads in the first place, as I recall. <laughs> yeah, weren't they? To, they brought them into um, combat. Con, uh, yeah. control, control a beetle of some kind. Yeah. Oh, that was it. Yeah, and the they ate their beetle. Yeah. Nothing's come to eat the cane toad. <laughs> Well, it, apparently the cane beetle, it turns out that it lived at the top of the cane and the yep. frogs were at the yeah. bottom of the cane. Yep. They couldn't Surely get to it. it, it just, <laughs> yeah, they couldn't get to it. <laughs> Although I do want to point out there have been many population Sometimes control techniques that have worked very yeah. well. So well, Khaleesi virus worked do. very well on the rabbits and it, they still haven't mutated sufficient uh, resistance to it, so it still works. Yeah. And she's still got at least two pet dragons that she... Different <laughs> Sorry. Um, burr, burr. All right. That's a very good time to move on, I think. Penny, ice cores from Greenland have long been used to track global climate change, and there's a lot of information to be gained from studying the pockets of air trapped in the ice from thousands of years ago. But a team from the University of Oxford have studied ice cores for a more archaeological purpose. And they've been detailing the economic growth of the ancient Roman Empire, which is pretty cool. It is really cool. And it's really interesting too. Um, one of the things I studied at university was classics and archaeology. So I've always been quite interested in Rome. And it's interesting because we know compared to most or many ancient civilizations, we know so much about Rome. And yet there's so much that we just don't know because obviously the texts and the information that have survived is all produced by a certain class of people for a certain purpose and then you know the texts had to be valued continuously to um, generations that copied them and kept them so we know a lot about their poetry their politics the way their legal system worked we don't have any kind of records or not you know that we would find very useful of like their GDP or anything like that and it's interesting whether even you know they manage their economy in the way that um, modern societies do or, or how it was managed. We just don't know because a lot of those records, if they were even kept, don't survive. So you might think, well, Penny, you know, you're going on about like, you know, Roman textual analysis, but what does this have to do with ice cores? And one of the things that the Romans did do was they had silver currency and to get the silver they had to mine ores and process them, and as they processed these ores, lead was released into the atmosphere, which made its way to Greenland and got laid down in layers of snow and ice. So these, this ice core data is actually, um, again, not new data. It was taken from a, a disused core that got abandoned and it recorded 40,000 years of snowfalls. And the core was analysed to find out what were the lead levels between sort of 1200 BC to 1200 AD. So that's really the lower and upper sort of, you know, covering the lower and upper reaches of sort of ancient times into medieval times. Um, what they found was, and they were able to take, I think it was 12 measurements a year rather than a previous study, which I remember reading about, which I think based its analysis of something like 18 measurements in total so the ice core was continuously melted and analyzed to get this really detailed graph of lead measurements throughout the years and this can be used as a proxy a very rough proxy but as good as anything else we have and possibly better I'm, I'm no expert in this in terms of getting what was going on with Rome's economy and it seems to be like when we know historically like things were disrupted like when the Roman Republic was on the way out there was less lead pollution, less mining. There's a big change in lead pr production, which corresponds to when um, 
the currency was devalued. So instead of being pure silver, it would be 80% silver. So, you know, there was less mining needed to produce the, com- the, the currency that it got recalled and was, mm-hmm. um, what's the word, adulterated, I guess, with other things. But when the Roman Empire was peaceful and prosperous, um, you see lead emissions rising, which suggests more, um, more activity, uh, more mining, um, and possibly it's not just coins but also other activity building and so on. And you see dips when there's plagues. So I think that's just fascinating. It's, it's also interesting um, the next step of this study is to have a look at the isotopes of the lead because obviously the Romans weren't the only culture active at this time but it's been assumed that because the Mediterranean was closest to Greenland it's probably going to be most highly influenced by Roman lead emissions, but you need to discount what was going on in the Americas. So possibly studying the lead isotopes that are found might um, give some answers to that. But I really love this story. I always like when um, science and history come together like this um, mm-hmm. and because there are some things that, yeah, just are really difficult to reconstruct or to reconstruct something like an idea of what was going on with the Roman economy, there's so many assumptions you have to make. And if this can be used as a proxy for how much lead was being mined at a certain time, you have, you know, a bit more data to feed into what's going on. So, yeah, I thought this was just fascinating. And it's also that precision is extraordinary too, Mm. the 12 measurements Mm. per year. I assume that's just the technology that they're using can get such very precise uh, small samples from tiny amounts, yeah. I guess. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. I like the point that was made in that the, um, the Atlantic article about this particular graph being likely to be uh, produced in, in 50 articles over the next 10 years because it's such a stunning graph when you look at the timeline of events that we have some degree of, of precision uh, knowledge around mm. uh, um, due to archaeological information, um, that these these spikes in lead, you know, uh, correlate with them. It's it's very very cool. It's, it's it might become the sort of the equivalent of the the hockey stick, um, uh, you mm. know, for for, uh, for for this sort of technology and ice core. Yeah, yeah it's very cool. Yeah, I shudder to think what ice cores are going to look like for our time in two thousand years or so. That'll be a bit scary, I think. Well, I guess there, there might not be all that many ice ice cores from our time because there wasn't much ice being laid down. <laughs> might not be ice. That's no, a, that's ice a scarily good down. point. I oh, can't believe I didn't even think I'm of that. I'm pretty sure we've left our mark. Yes. Sad to say. Indelibly. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about birds. And I think, Lucas, it's been well established that magpies are pretty intelligent birds. We've seen them use tools and problem solve quite extensively. Well, now it appears the clever birds have also learnt the calls of other birds, sort of eavesdropping on their communications to learn when predators are near and which predators. That's very cunning. <laughs> very cunning indeed. We, uh, I don't know. I think we did... Seem the right word. <laughs> <laughs> no, no I'm, I'm totally with it. Uh, I think cunning is the right word. Um, we, we did a magpie story, I think, back in February, uh, where we were looking at some a study over in WA where... Um, magpies that lived in larger groups were sort of developing a, a group intelligence and, and problem solving um, you know, more effectively. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I, 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 I'm discovering about myself. I seem to be attracted to these magpie stories, <laughs> which is interesting. But, but yeah, this one was quite cool. So this one was looking at um, magpies utilising information from other species, particularly in this case from uh, this small native honey eater called a noisy miner. Uh, and these noisy miners that often live in the same the same environments as the as the magpies they they, they live in the same ecosystem um, they've got different calls that that are known to indicate that there's an either an aerial predator or a ground-based predator nearby so the noisy miners repeat these these warnings to their group um, and then you know the, the birds obviously take the appropriate action well that in itself is not not you know amazing because there's lots of species that do that um, but what is very interesting about this is is this study looked into whether magpies were also uh, modifying their behavior as a result of these calls. Um, 
I won't go into the the uh, the design of the of the study, but suffice it to say, um, they they lured lured wild magpies with grated cheese apparently, and uh, and they played these these noisy minor calls and and they they videotaped the results. They also had a control. Um, where they rolled a large orange ball towards the magpies and, and um, they used that to ascertain how much they would normally tilt their beaks, tilt their heads to see the orange ball approaching them, which obviously would stand out to them because it's not usually there. Um, an orange ball mm. does stand out against the background. <laughs> So, uh, so it gave them a, a bit of a benchmark as to how much they would sort of look down when, when there was a, a, something that was nearby on the ground. And then what they did then was basically um, they, they measured, using the videotapes, they measured the tilt of the beaks of the magpies as an indication of, of how, I guess, how attentive they were to, to looking down or looking up, uh, as opposed to just their normal looking around, if you like. And what they found was there were quite significant indications that when they played the um, the noise of minor call indicating there was a ground-based predator, that um, there was a, 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 a maximum beak angle, as they called it, uh, or a average maximum of 24 degrees um, of tilt, and uh, and even greater for an aerial warning. And and yeah, they, basically they they showed that there was a, a, a quite a strong correlation between playing these calls and the magpies looking in the direction of where the calls were coming from. So. They also had a look at, well, what happens if we play a different call, say a, a generic non-warning call from a, from a crimson rosella that often also shares the same ecosystem? Magpies didn't care, didn't pay any attention to it. They just picked <laughs> that out, wasn't of any particular interest to them. Um, there's also uh, um, example, there was a, a video, I think, in the in the in one of the stories about this that, that uh, I saw that was comparing playing these sorts of calls for pigeons for example and they didn't pay any attention there's just of no interest to them it was in another story that pigeons i saw are stupid yes <laughs> um so yeah it was uh, wow. really really interesting and there was a, a and that that was actually that reminded me of another story that i saw today which i know this is not on our list but there was this other one where they were looking at crows mm. Um, that um, uh, the way that they they basically train each other um, about groups uh, about um, threats in their environment, and there was this this woman I think it was in Seattle that she this uh, this student that she would go in and feed these crows in a in a in a park for uh, several weeks. She would take in peanuts and leave for them. And they'd all eat the peanuts. And then she turns up wearing this incredibly creepy mask, um, <laughs> carrying a dead crow. And the crows go completely mental. And they're all calling to each other. And all these crows all gather on the surrounding trees, looking down at this really freaky mask woman <laughs> carrying a dead, a dead crow. And then I think... Um, she then went back the next day with, with Peanuts not wearing the mask and the crows were a little bit sort of freaked out still, but they still came to eat the, the Peanuts, but they weren't, you know, they weren't overly exuberant about it. And then she came back wearing the mask and they all went freaking mental again. So, yeah, these birds, they, they've, got, uh, they've got skills. <laughs> I don't know what that's telling us apart from creepy masks are creepy. <laughs> and Max I don't know whether know it. the mask was chosen but to look freaky, but because this was a video that I saw, I saw it today at some point, and this woman was mm. walking you know, in the park wearing this. And I was thinking, surely other people in the park are seeing this woman in this mask and being freaked out because it looks, you know, it just looks wrong. So anyway, but uh, yeah. No, that's pretty normal in Seattle. <laughs> right. <laughs> <Look at> <laughs> no <one> birds <laughs> are, are really smart. I mean, especially magpies. So, so I, you know, I have that, the minor bird and the magpie thing here. So I don't find that story particularly uh, surprising. So I, my one of my cats will walk up the side of the house and the minor birds will go absolutely bananas. And so I right. can actually hear them doing that. And I have learned that if I hear them doing that, that means my cat's walking up the side of the house. So, so the the next, <laughs> oh, I found the then cat. The, bir the birds, the the magpies are really smart. They they actually sit on the fence here and they know exactly where the cat food is and they know exactly where the cats are. So it doesn't make make right. It's right. not surprising uh -huh. at all to me that they that they learn well. If the minor birds are making that noise, the cats around. 
I think that, that makes mm. perfect sense. They're really, really smart birds. I, I think that the interesting thing, though, is the dis- distinguishing a completely different species, different calls that, that indicate threats from different 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 places. places. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That means they're understanding, and it's not just that one thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, pretty amazing. It is, and I think that's our show. As usual, you can find all the links in the show notes or at scienceontop.com slash 297. And don't forget, you can help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and supporting us on Patreon. As always, the best way you can support the show is by telling your friends about us and posting about it on social media. Thank you for joining us today, Elena Hansen. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Yeah, I had a really good time because I, I learned so much and I was like now I want to go write articles about all these things do it do it <laughs> <laughs> I should, yeah is there anything you wanted to plug or have you got anything going on um no at, at the moment I think I'm all good I think I'm going to be an intern at Cosmos magazine oh. potentially oh wow so awesome. uh, look out for my work there um pretty soon um but if you want you can go onto my website it's a wordpress um, site and I've got all my cool stuff there if you'd ever like to get in touch with me. We'll definitely check it out. What's the address? Um, so it's my name, so elenahanson.wordpress.com. You can find all my science stuff and all my journalism stuff going on there. Very cool. And we'll have a link to that in the show notes, of course. Awesome. Thank you. And, of course, thank you, Penny, Lucas, and Peter. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. And don't forget to check out watchingeuropa.com to see Peter Miller's uh, audio visual experience, Europa-themed experience. Oh, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Then one day, Swift shows up looking very different. Wearing a mask and wig, she carries a dead taxidermied crow. The first one that sees her sounds the alarm. The flock erupts in protest. The crows seem to wail and scold her and the dead bird. Swift calls these crow funerals, though they're not the solemn memorials we put on for our dead. She thinks these noisy gatherings are opportunities for crows to learn about the dangers that surround them within the safety of the group. 